Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, good morning or good afternoon, technically. Uh, we think it's a, a sufficient number of minutes past the official start date that we've probably picked up most people who are uh, wrestling with uh, a standard ANU parking problem, um, but no doubt there'll be others uh, uh, coming in and out. Um, uh, my name's Andrew McIntyre, uh, Dean here of the college and director of the new Research School of Asia and Pacific. Warm welcome to everybody, especially, especially folks that have come from outside the university uh, from across the lake or, uh, or even perhaps uh, further afield. Um, this, uh, this panel discussion today uh, uh, promises to be a lively one on, 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 on really big issues. And I just want to pay um, a tribute at the outset to um, uh, Dr. Tyrrell Habercorn uh, and her colleagues uh, who have worked to pull this, uh, this session together, uh, bringing scholars, from, uh, uh, scholars interested in Thailand uh, from across the university together, uh, particularly uh, from the College of Law and here from the College of Asia and the Pacific. Um, uh, I uh, had the privilege of uh, being here to uh, uh, push the button or cut the ribbon at the, um, at the uh, special uh, session like this about a year ago uh, that was organised uh, and was struck then by the, just the vibrance, the intensity uh, of the interest uh, uh, within the room. Uh, for that session, and uh, uh, I'm sure it'll be uh, uh, the same today. Uh, this is a really challenging time for Thailand, uh, really challenging time for Thais, and a challenging time for all the friends of Thailand uh, in Australia uh, and around the region. Um, this, uh, this, this panel will bring some of those challenges uh, into focus. Uh, I'm sure uh, there'll, be, uh, there'll be vigorous debate. Um, it can't be otherwise. These are inherently difficult human issues. They're just inherently difficult issues. Um, um, sometimes people outside universities see debate and argument uh, inside universities um, as a sign that something's not working or something's going wrong. Uh, I think it's the opposite. As a dean, I would be profoundly worried uh, if, uh, let me indulge myself and say, all my academics, all my academic colleagues in whatever field, um, uh, whether it be studies of Thailand, studies of Indonesia, uh, or some other uh, field, if they were all in furious agreement. That's a sure sign that you haven't got a sufficiently diverse mix. And the best universities have diverse mixes. That's what makes them strong in whatever fields they invest heavily in. So for me, lively debate, respectfully lively debate, is one of the core contributions of great universities. It's one of the key things we do for society. Um, so enjoy lively debate, because I'm pretty sure that's what you'll get. Um, just, just one other thought. Um, some of you will be aware that um, the Australia Thai, Thai, Insti Thai Thailand Institute uh, commissioned a, a report recently, the Lowe report did, on basically where Thai studies is heading in Australia. There's all sorts of interesting stuff in there. And one, one, um, one line caught my attention we're saying, when we think about how most Australians perceive and relate to Thailand, unlike the situation with the way in which most Australians relate to some other countries in Asia, which is in a more, the way the report put it, was in a more intellectual way, um, the way most Australians relate to Thailand is the term they used was a more experiential way. It's by having visited Thailand as on a beach or in a bar or in a hotel, often in sort of tourist or sorts of engagements, rather than more considered, as again the term they used was more intellectual engagement, uh, thinking about the, uh, the deeper economic issues, the deeper social issues, political issues, cultural issues, strategic issues. Uh, and I think that's probably a fair characterisation of how uh, most Australians uh, perceive and, and relate to Thailand. But it's not true of here. What you'll find here today 
uh, is a deeply intellectual engagement uh, with, the, uh, with, with, with these huge challenges uh, before Thailand at the moment. Um, and as I say, that's, that's what universities are here for, to wrestle with the ideas. That's how knowledge advances. So um, I look forward to hearing uh, uh, what people have to say. I've got a duck out just now, but I'll be back a bit later. Um, and uh, in the very unlikely uh, outcome, everyone's in agreement, somebody sent me a note complaining. Thanks. Tyrrell, over to you. Thank you, Professor McIntyre, for your comments. Um, my name is Tyrrell Habercoin, and I'm a research fellow in the Department of Political and Social Change in the School of International Political and Strategic Studies, which is the school in this building. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleagues who will be speaking today and to welcome all of you. This event comes on the one-year anniversary of the protests and clashes between Thai state security forces and the red-shirted members of the United Democratic Front Against Dictatorship, or the UDD, which shook Bangkok and actually the entire Thai nation last April and May. At least 92 people were killed and over 2,100 injured, many seriously so, um, on both the civilian side and the state security force side. Hundreds of people were arrested and detained, some remain in detention. Even after the violence ended, the climate remained very tense um, as rumor, fear, and uncertainty circulated. In the past year, there's been a dramatic upsurge in the use of Article 112, which criminalizes speech deemed to be damaging to the monarchy and the Computer Crimes Act. Um, a year later, the struggle for legitimacy and the right to determine who counts as a subject of politics, part of what was at stake last year, remains in question. Um, what's been added to this has been a question about what constitutes the truth of what happened last year. Um, in the last three to four months, a number of reports have emerged um, just very recently, the first periodic report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Thailand, led by Dr. Kanit Nanakon. Um, in late January, the referral to the ICC, um, created by the law firm of Amsterdam and Paroff, uh, the lawyer for former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat. Um, and most recently, this week, a comprehensive report by Human Rights Watch. Um, was released. And I mention this just to note that there was an article in Mati Chon on Tuesday, which I think highlights the importance and perhaps danger of this forum happening in Australia, in which Deputy Prime Minister Sukhep criticized the Human Rights Watch report um, and noted that perhaps the foreigners would be better off solving unresolved crimes in their own country, such as the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Um, also this week, Prime Minister Apisit Veja Diva announced the impending dissolution of parliament, which suggests that elections are on the way. The first part of this year has held tremendous tension along the Thai-Cambodia border, um, although the most recent news suggests that perhaps the fighting may be easing. Um, on other borders, including um, the border with Malaysia, the ongoing conflict, which seemed to decline in 2009 and early 2010, appears to have intensified again, um, and the Thai-Burma border has also been restive. Um, as Professor McIntyre noted, this event is also in many ways um, a follow-up to the event that we held last year, uh, which was entitled Thailand on the Verge. And I, I would note that it seems to me that a year later, the verge has long been passed, um, and that's where the name for this event comes from. It seems as though perhaps a limit is being, is being approached politically, socially, historically. What happens once that limit is reached is, is probably anyone's guess. So the format of the rest of today's panel discussion is that each of our seven fantastic experts will speak for 10 minutes uh, precisely, um, and then we'll open the floor to your questions and discussion. So, uh, so I want to stop there and actually introduce Professor Peter War from the Crawford School of Economics and Government. Thanks, Tyrrell, and uh, thanks very much for organising this event. Can everyone hear me? I have the flu, as you can probably tell. So, uh, anyway, it's only ten minutes, so my voice will probably last out. Everyone believes that the parliament is about to be dissolved in Thailand, and that therefore we'll have an election within 60 days, so it seems, anyway. We thought that this was going to happen tomorrow, but I saw some reports in the press yesterday from SUTEP that maybe there'll be a few days of delay. But anyway, the election ought to be taking place 
uh, in early July. That's the most likely thing. And it's going to be a very important election for the future of Thailand. One characterization of the contest between Thaksin Shinawat's Pia Thai group on the one hand and the Democrats on the other is that Thaksin and his colleagues are populist. Indeed, uh, we read reports that in order to compete politically with Thaksin's group, the Democrats have been pushed towards becoming more populist themselves. But hardly anyone says what populism actually means. And I wasn't too sure myself as of yesterday, so I did some research to try to find out. And what I'm going to tell you is what I learned about the meaning of populism, how it might apply to the Thai situation, and what it means for the future. I want to mention before I launch into that, that the National Thai Studies Centre will be having its uh, Thai update conference the last week of September of this year, after the election, so that we can review the uh, outcome of the election and what it means for the long term. I didn't want the update before the election because then we'd be distracted onto short term, uh, short term issues about who's going to win and so forth. Uh, okay, populism. Wikipedia says populism is an ideology or more uncommonly a political philosophy or type of discourse that compares the people against the elite. There's a book about populism in Asia written by our friend and colleague Pasuk Pongpaichit and a, a colleague whose name I won't try to pronounce. It was reviewed in New Mandela some time ago. You can find the review on New Mandela. And uh, what uh, Pasuk and her co-author say is that it's a political philosophy emphasising the rights and power of the people in their struggle against the privileged elite usually complemented by anti-intellectualism, anti-elitism, and often anti-foreign sentiments. Okay, the great book on populism. This one, just recently been published, it's about populism in Latin America. It's by the, the UCLA economist Sebastian Edwards. Uh, you can read that, yes. Latin America and the false promise of populism. So uh, Edwards looks at populism in economic terms, and that's what I'm going to do as well. He describes populism as an emphasis on public expenditures that win popular support through short-term redistributions. Oops, I want the, I want the slideshow. It's F5, isn't it? Yeah. Short-term redistributions rather than investments that raise long-term productivity. If the short-term redistributions are matched by contractions in investment that would have promoted long-term productivity, then public expenditure doesn't get out of control. But if it's not at the expense of that, then public expenditure does get out of control, tends to be financed by monetary creation, and that causes hyperinflation. That's a part of the Latin American story. Not a part of the Thai story so far, thank goodness. Hyperinflation is terrible. Thai populism. Uh, I was in Bangkok less than two weeks ago, and this is from Sunday, 10 days ago, something like that, from The Nation. Thaksin, uh, in absentia, is giving his election uh, agenda address to the assembled group from Pua Thai. This, was, this event occurred at Rangsit University, on the outskirts of Bangkok. I know you can't read the text. Uh, the first sentence begins, as all nation newspaper articles about Thaksin do, fugitive former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat. They always, <laughs> anytime you see those words, it's the nation. And there's, uh, and there's the Bangkok Post uh, coverage of the same event. And Thaksin's on video. He's in Dubai, I believe. And uh, there are all the Thai people there. And Thaksin's telling us what his economic agenda is. Well, good for him. He's telling us that we don't have a clear agenda from Democrats yet, so I'm going to focus on Thaksin. Anyway, that's where populism, the concept, is relevant. What was Thaksin's agenda? Well, during his own term in office, Thaksin, uh, let me 
oversimplify, there were three strands to his economic policies. There were huge mega projects. There were policies intended to protect the monopolies that Thaksin happened to own, protect them against competition from foreigners and from other Thai business people. And there were redistributive policies. It's by no means the case that all of Thaksin's redistributive policies were a bad idea, not at all. One that was a brilliant policy innovation was the 30 baht health plan. But there were many other cash handout policies that were classic populism. Purchased short-term political support, and as I'll show later, at the expense of long-term investment. And the economic agenda that Thaksin has set out for us is more of the same. There are these huge mega projects, some of which may make perfect sense Thaksin's full of ideas, and some of them will be good ideas. They have to be studied carefully. Some of them may well make sense. Um, 30 bar, a 30 to 60 kilometre wall to protect Bangkok from flooding could be a good idea. Water diversion project to bring water diverted from Burma, Laos and Cambodia. Have the Burmese, the Laos and the Cambodians been consulted about that yet? I don't know about that. I doubt it. Uh, uh, high-speed train links, etc. A, a land bridge, not a canal apparently, a land bridge across the uh, Thai uh, mainland connecting the Gulf of Thailand with the Andaman Sea. There have been numerous such projects in the past, lots of fighting among the different provincial administrations as to whose province would get it. So, uh, new electric train, that's, and so on. Huge capital intensive projects, plenty of them, Thaksin has lots of ideas like that. And then some economic policies as well. <clears throat> For people, anybody at all, not just farmers, but anybody at all, uh, having a debt between 500,000 million, 500, and a million baht, you'll get a moratorium financed by the government. There will be uh, a revenue guarantee for local administrative organisations. Farmers will get credit cards. There will be... Uh, a minimum salary uh, guaranteed by the government, presumably. There will be a uh, 15,000 baht minimum per month, minimum salary guarantee for anyone who graduates with a bachelor's degree. And so on. Tax cuts for firm home, first home buyers, tax cuts for first car buyers, free Wi-Fi in public areas. Not presuming at all that any or all of these are bad ideas, not at all, they're populism, that's my point. Uh, a minimum guaranteed price for rice. An increase in the minimum wage of 300 baht, uh, two 300 baht per day. Uh, one of the few things that the Democrats have clarified for us about their economic policy is more or less the same thing. I think the Democrats promised to increase the minimum wage to 250 baht per day, but the two agree about that. Uh, I'll skip some of the others. Um, <clears throat> eliminate the drugs problem within 12 months. Well, that was, that's familiar. <laughs> We've heard that one. Taksin had, had that policy before. You know what his mechanism for eliminating the drug? Uh, more than 2,000 extrajudicial murders took place. And the last one, eliminate poverty within four years. I presume this, the mechanism for reducing poverty will not be the same as the mechanism for... Uh, getting rid of the drug dealers, I'm sure it's not, uh, sure it's not. Uh, we heard that promise last time Thaksin was elected, 2001, he was going to get rid of poverty in five years. Well, still with us, unfortunately. What's missing? There's nothing there about education reform. The basic problem of long-term economic development in Thailand, I submit, is the uh, outdated education system, particularly primary and secondary education, not the universities, primary and secondary. There's nothing there about tax reform. That's really important for Thailand because the Thai tax system discriminates against the poor and in favour of the rich. It's a regressive tax system. It's really important that that be reformed. Finally, there's nothing in there about agricultural productivity. I'm an agricultural economist. That's why I'm particularly interested in that. I think it just happens to be particularly important. Two minutes. Uh, right. 
What I want to show here is one. Uh, forget the first table, we don't have time for that. Uh, first, the number of the poor in Thailand that are in rural areas is very high by Asian, even by Asian standards. 86% of all people, according to the Thai statistics, the data come from the World Bank. According to the World Bank's um, analysis of the Thai statistics, 86% of all poor people are in rural areas in Thailand. Much higher than Indonesia, India, and even higher than China. More important point is, the sources of poverty reduction in Thailand can be divided into three. Reduction within rural areas. People who are within rural areas at the beginning of some particular period, it's 93 to 2005, and are still there at the end. That's one. Reduction within urban areas. That's two. And third, poverty reduction that occurs because people move from the high poverty area rural to the er low poverty area urban and become non-poor as a result. Those three things. The overwhelmingly important one for Thailand is the first much more important relative to the others than for any of those other countries. 91% of all poverty reduction in Thailand over that interval has, it has occurred within the rural areas. What drives rural poverty reduction? What, what causes the reduction in poverty that's actually occurred? Very impressive over the long term. What causes it is economic growth, ladies and gentlemen. Economic growth. And there's my evidence. The top line is annual GDP growth, not agriculture total. The red line is the, re the annual change in rural poverty incidence. If that goes up, poverty is going up. If it goes down, poverty is going down. The faster the growth of GDP, the faster the reduction in rural poverty. The red line is rural poverty. There's only one data point that's an exception from that, and that's the Asian financial crisis, and I'll explain that exception in the discussion period if anybody wants it. Finally, what drives, uh, what drives GDP growth, particularly occurring in agriculture? If you do that diagram for agricultural GDP growth, the correlation is even more stunning. What drives it? One of the things that really drive it is investment in agricultural research and extension because the, technology, the new technologies available in agriculture must be adapted to local conditions and that takes investment. Look what's happened. 1961 to 1994, the sh share of uh, in expenditure on those things relative to agricultural value added rose, collapsed, Not 2001 to 2006. Guess who was in office during that time? The transfers that Thaksin implemented were at the expense of long-term productive investment, particularly in agriculture, classic populism. I'll stop there. Thanks a lot. I'd like to introduce Dr. Andrew Walker from the School of International Political and Strategic Studies. Now, Peter and I don't have much in common except the first three letters of our name, that's the order. Um, but I think it'll be interesting, I think there's some very interesting parallels between what I'm talking about and what Peter was talking about, in particular the focus on productivity. Um, I want to step back from some of the specifics of what's happened over the last year or two in Thailand and look at some of the, the deep drivers, and I think one of the most important deep drivers is a change in the political culture of Thailand's peasants and what I'm calling middle income peasants. And I want to do it by talking, taking you through three propositions. The first proposition is peasants in Thailand are, for the most part, no longer poor. They're middle income peasants. Now remember Peter said that 86% of poor people in Thailand are in rural areas. He didn't say 86% of rural people, rural people are poor. Okay, so just, don't, just keep that 86% figure in mind in that context. Um, now why, why are they no longer poor? For exactly the reasons Peter was talking about, because of economic growth. Here's a graph of GDP per capita in Thailand since the 1960s. Dramatic economic growth. You can see the financial crisis of the late 1990s there. This economic growth has 
produced dramatic improvements in rural standards of living. Rural poverty in the 60s was 96%, now around 13%. Infant mortality declined to first world standards, primary school completion dramatically improving. Let's look at one particular indicator, and that is income. If we look at the averages, and here I'm focusing on averages, um, rural incomes, non-municipal incomes are on average 320% of the poverty line. Um, Land-owning farmers, on average, 280% of the poverty line. Tenant farmers, on average, 270% of the pov poverty line. Even the poorest people in rural communities, agricultural workers, on average, double the poverty line. Now, this is uh, occurring throughout Thailand, even in areas that are the poorest in Thailand, the northeast. So, you know, Thaksin did make that commitment. He didn't eliminate po poverty. But over that period, and since we have seen dramatic declines in, in poverty throughout Thailand, um, four million people being lifted above the poverty line um, in the northeast. So, proposition one, by and large, people in rural Thailand are no longer poor, they're middle income peasants. But what I've been talking about is absolute poverty. Um, we've got to distinguish that, and this is a point Peter's made many times, We've got to distinguish that from relative poverty. And a lot of discussion in politics in Thailand would benefit from people being much more careful about the difference between absolute poverty and relative poverty. There's very significant relative poverty in Thailand. There's national economic disparity, which I'm suggesting is primarily a result of the relatively low productivity of agriculture. There's the disparity. Um, red, lower income, blue, higher income, it's obvious where the red shirts come from. Um, there's very clear regional and urban-rural economic disparity in Thailand. Now, one of the principal causes of this economic disparity is the relatively low productivity of agriculture, exactly what Peter was talking about. The blue line indicates per capita productivity in agriculture. So what does each worker in agriculture produce in terms of Thailand's GDP? Um, you can see it's increased. It's increased in recent years and this has made a major contribution um, to reducing rural poverty, um, but it's at a much lower base and at times it's increased much slower than labour productivity in industry. So that's, that, that graph, in a sense, encapsulates one of the core dimensions of Thailand's economic disparity, of the relative poverty of people in rural areas. That graph's a bit complicated. Here's an easy couple of figures that I think really highlights this point. And these two figures tell you a lot about what's going on in Thai politics. Agriculture contributes 12% of Thailand's GDP, but that 12% is produced by about 42% of the workforce. Um, so, doing a quick little bit of maths, which I sometimes can do, labour outside agriculture is more than five times as productive as labour within agriculture. So, to the extent that rural people depend on agriculture, and of course they combine that with many other things, but to the extent that they rely on agriculture, they are relying on a relatively unproductive sector of the economy. So, that's, th that's my second proposition. Not absolutely poor anymore but relatively poor due to the relatively low productivity of agriculture. Third proposition. How am I going for time, Tyrrell? Uh, you have... Oh, only halfway there. I can slow down a bit. OK, now this, this is the key point. This is where we really get down to the, the political nuts and bolts. The Thai state now plays a central role in supporting the rural economy. Now, I think there's a very important debate here, and, and I agree with a lot of what Peter said. A lot of that support is sort of, in a, in a sense, drip feed support rather than productivity enhancing support. And, and we see the effect of that in those low productivity figures for agriculture. But let's just look at, at this dramatic change in the role of the Thai state in terms of the rural economy. Here's a graph that might look a bit complex, but it's really very easy. This is about the impact of Thai government policies on the crop prices that farmers receive. So how much can they sell their rice or corn or sugar or whatever for? Now the blue line, sort of across the top there, at naught, represents a neutral position, as if the government had no effect on prices at all. 
freely operating market, I suppose. So you can see in the 1970s, farm gate prices were very significantly lowered by government policy. And one of the main contributors to that was the rice premium, which was essentially a tax on rice growers, um, really peaked in, in the, in the mid-1970s. But since then, the trend has been upwards, where, whereas now, and this doesn't capture some of the recent very generous crop subsidy schemes, um, now, overall, government policy has a slightly positive effect on crop prices. Um, so, essentially, from pulling a lot of surplus out of the rural economy, um, the effect now is some degree of subsidy for the rural economy, purely focusing here on crop prices. Another way of looking at this transformation in the government's role in relation to the rural economy, government agricultural budget. Um, and this is real increase. This is expressed in 2008 values. In the 60s, five or six billion spent on agriculture, climbing up to 100 um, billion. Um, you'll notice during the Tuxin period, the growth, um, the populist period of Tuxin, the growth wasn't remarkable. Certainly unremarkable compared to, to some of the earlier periods during the 80s and 90s. Um, so all governments of all political persuasions in Thailand have made this very big budgetary commitment um, to the agricultural sector. And this is a lot about the changing political role of rural people um, within Thai politics. So very heavy dependence in the rural economy on this agricultural budget, supports crop prices, provides infrastructure, provides irrigation weirs, and outside the agricultural budget, a whole range of social welfare and subsidy schemes, some of which Peter referred to in his presentation. Now, what does all this mean for political culture? Two minutes, I can do it. Let me talk about this change in political culture just by looking at two, two sets of statements. Here's, here's a classic statement from very famous political, political scientist, James Scott, about Asia's poor peasantry. And this is the classic sort of peasant paradigm from the 60s and 70s. And he starts with this quote, there are districts in which the position of the rural population is that of a man standing permanently up to the neck in water. So even the slightest ripple will drown him. Now, if you're in that position, that subsistence obsessed position, then things like taxes and rents are p potentially disastrous. They can put you under, you can die, you, you, you starve, your household fails. So Scott says that this subsistence ethic informs a particular political approach. And he says taxes and rents together or individually form the twin issues around which peasant anchor in Southeast Asia has classically coalesced. Now let's look at another set of statements by another classic work, soon to be classic hopefully, um, about Thailand's middle income peasantry. Completely different dynamic. Subsistence is no longer a primary concern. For these middle income peasants, the primary livelihood challenge has moved away from food security to the middle income challenges of diversification, productivity and disparity. And here there's a brand new political dynamic. This dynamic is about not minimising surplus extraction, but maximising state subsidy through the sorts of schemes Peter talked about. And it's no longer the intrusive presence of the state through taxes that's likely to make people protest and get politically active. It's the state's disinterest, absence or forced withdrawal. The rural community now needs that state subsidy to back up its relatively non-productive sectors. And my suggestion is, if we want to understand the rise of Tuxin, the rise of the red shirt movement amongst middle income peasants like this, we need to understand the political importance of defending this relationship between rural people and the state. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Dr. Craig Reynolds from the School of Culture, History and Language. My sympathies with the audience who has to put up with seven speakers popping up different disciplines, uh, different uh, accents, different topics. Uh, the title of this talk is Autocratic Rule in the Neighborhood. Almost 12 months ago, after the killing and the burning of the Bangkok Business District had ended, a prominent Thai public intellectual wrote an article in the Thai language Matichon Weekly on the culture of the army. He asked himself some questions. 
How do armies in modern times induce human beings to overcome concern for their own lives and be bloodthirsty enough to kill other human beings in battle? His answer was that one method to carry out this grim task is to dehumanize the enemy, to make the enemy into a devil. He used the English word demonize. Why did the Center for the Resolution of the Emergency Situation find it necessary to release information about the plan to overthrow the monarchy before it set about dispersing the crowds? Precisely because it had first to demonize the enemy. The institution of the monarchy in Thai society has become the center of the universe for everyone's well-being, the columnist said. People in every occupation, including soldiers, are able to imagine a future for themselves in which they gradually advance to this or that goal. At the very least, they inspire to a degree of security, even if it is only to cling to the security they already enjoy. Today they are privates, tomorrow they are sergeants, and perhaps before retirement they may reach second lieutenant. The real meaning of overthrow the monarchy is the termination of this state of well-being, as well as the career prospects that soldiers have come to expect. This would have an inescapable impact on each and every soldier, as well as his wife and children. And this is one of the things that motivated the soldiers to kill. They wanted to ensure the only future they knew, the only future they could imagine. So the columnist focuses the reader's attention on the supreme institution the pole star around which the lives of everyone in the society spins. Certainly a lot of political effort, particularly since the 2006 coup, has involved keeping attention fixed on that reference point, that heavenly body. This is a very inward looking perspective and it's understandable why it is so inward looking. But I want to step away from Thailand briefly and look at the country as belonging to a set of countries that are historically linked with political systems that have much in common. <coughs> During the demonstration and violence last year, the occasional comparison was made between Thailand and military rule in Myanmar. But otherwise, there was very little comment on Thailand's place among its mainland neighbors. What has been missing from media and academic commentary is the regional context. Since decolonization after the Second World War, democracy has been a problem in mainland Southeast Asia. Governments voted into office are often one-party governments. Authoritarian governments like elections because the leaders can then say they have come to power through the electoral process. The distinction between elections and democracy is often not made. Participatory democracy is undermined if elections are not free and competitive. Vote buying, candidates hang handing out cash and other inducements to voters, is a recurrent issue, leading to the widespread belief that elections are fixed. And there is another problem. The political culture in a participatory democracy needs to be tolerant of dissent. But those in the region already in power strive to limit dissent and manipulate democracy to ensure not just their longevity in office, but permanency of rule. This is certainly what motivated Police Lieutenant Colonel Thaksin Shinawat when he was Prime Minister and ran his party like a cartel. Let us look across the mainland. In Myanmar, the army has governed for nearly 50 years. Yes, there were elections last year, and there is evidence of military dictatorship easing, but some kind of military rule seems inevitable, even on the most distant horizon. In Cambodia, where they have elections, a strong man is still in power decades after he was installed as prime minister by the Vietnamese during their military occupation of the country. In socialist Laos and communist Vietnam, only one party is allowed to field candidates in national elections. In Malaysia, there is more multi-party activity, but the United Malays National Organization, the dominant party and ruling coalition since independence, alters the constitution in its favor and regularly rearranges electorates to preserve its electoral advantage. In Singapore, the People's Action Party hobbles other parties if they exhibit meaningful opposition and thus maintains its one-party dominance. These mainland countries all inherited their internal security laws from the Western imperial powers that colonized them. In the case of Thailand, from the Pax Americana in Southeast Asia that lasted from the end of World War II until the early 1970s. And this is the immediate neighborhood, this region of autocratic political systems in which Thai democracy is expected to put down its roots and flourish. Thailand is not an exception here. Thailand is one element in a regional political field that has systemic features. The juxtaposition of autocracy and democracy runs deep in the Thai elite psyche. 
Just days before the 1932 revolution that brought an end to the absolute monarchy, the seventh Bangkok king mulled over the possibility of a constitution, all the while clinging to the hope that the Thai people could be encouraged to support an absolute monarchy. He expressed it this way. This is King Prachatipo. Our country uses a dictatorship system of government, but our system is not like other dictator systems. On the contrary, it has many characteristics of a democracy. Thus, it is a sort of half and half, and we haven't really decided which system we will follow. This is May 1932. Thai and Western political scientists have written many thousands of words on semi-democracy in Thailand ever since. Indeed, semi-democracy, Khun Bai in Thai, may have come from this royal source. As the decades have passed, there has not been much improvement. And at this point, it's more like not 50-50 democracy, but one-quarter democracy or one-tenth democracy. If anything, history has merely reversed the formulation, as if to say, our country uses a democratic system of government, but it has many characteristics of dictatorship. The Janus figure of the benevolent dictator, the enlightened despot, still looms large in the minds of Thai political thinkers as they puzzle over the real significance of the 1932 event. Strong leadership, if necessary, strong leadership armed with tanks and guns, is admired as much as it is resented in Thailand. And there is a definite Buddhist element in this leadership style. The strong man, with or without a military background, is sometimes of ascetic demeanor, respected for his personal discipline and powers of self-control. Several prime ministers and would-be prime ministers fit this description. A Bangkok columnist writing in English has described this leadership variant as an amalgam of gangster and monk, the strong man and the ascetic in the one individual, always, of course, male. The current chairman of Thailand's Privy Council, General Prem Tinsunanon, was mentioned as a case in point. Major General Jamlong Simulan, a core leader of the Yellow Shirts, is another example. I am not suggesting that Thailand is doomed to autocratic rule. It is not destined to have forever what it has now, a military man in his army standing beside an internationally respectable Oxford-educated prime minister who wears nice suits, speaks fluent English, and has a Western nickname. Thailand is struggling with the institutions history has given it, institutions that one day look like dictatorship with characteristics of democracy, and the next day like a democratic system with characteristics of dictatorship. Thailand lives in a neighborhood of autocratic governments sanctioned by elections. And these governments share with Thailand's government the dark practices of arbitrary detention, killing with impunity, and the suppression of dissent by means of coercive laws. It's a very, very tough neighborhood to live in. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mark Nolan from the ANU College of Law. Thank you, Turrell, and thank you for the invitation to cross the college boundary, as it were, and to join um, some fellow speakers today. The saddest thing about Turrell organising these wonderful events is that we don't hear a paper from Turrell um, at these events, so maybe next year. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge some work done for me by Sarah Bishop as a research assistant. Um, I think the ANU College of Law and the College of Asia and Pacific should be mutually proud of producing um, if I can embarrass you for a moment, um, researchers such as Sarah who can work fluently in law and uh, Thai legal systems as well, Australian legal systems, English-speaking legal systems and Thai legal systems. Um, there are a few people in this room who know how poor my Thai is and that I can't translate Thai statute um, and other material, so thanks to Sarah. I'm not a high-caliber Thai study scholar like most of the people here, but I have considered counter-terrorism law um, from a domestic perspective in the context of the international urging for us to adopt moral counter uh, model counter-terrorism law, sometimes moral, sometimes not, model counter-terrorism law after 9-11. Um, I've been critical of the need for special terrorism laws beyond normal criminal law and criminal procedure. Um, I've used the term populism as well, penal populism, um, to think about the concerns that we have when counter-terrorism law in reaction to social protest is hastily passed, as it was in Australia, even more so than it was in Thailand, I think. Um, 
Some of what I'm going to say today reflects on my experience on sabbatical at the Law Faculty of Chulalongkorn University from July 2008 to February 2009, um, where I started to have my first dangerous thoughts, perhaps, about counterterrorism law, its appropriateness, and its appropriateness for prosecution of those involved in mass political protests uh, in Thailand. The Truth for Reconciliation Commission of Thailand in its first interim report, which has been mentioned already, um, alarmed me when I got to uh, the third or fourth last sentence there where it says that 145 cases of terrorism have been taken out against those um, who were part of the UDD protests, the red shirt protests. These are high rates of prosecution with counter-terrorism law. And you can see there that there are some other legal sources for actually um, prosecuting people who are involved in protest activity, some of which also use terrorism-related concepts of threatening the government in some fashion, coercing the government in some fashion. But we've probably all got our own political views about the red and the yellow shirt mass protests and the legal responses to those protests. I want you all to be thinking about what we think we know about the facts of 2008 protests and boycotts and occupations, um, as well as the 2010 activity. And I want to take you to the law, because many of you may not have done that before, to have a look at Thai um, counter-terrorism law, to see, a bit like in the Australian case, how broad this is and how exciting it is for the overexcited prosecutor. Because there's a lot of scope in this law. Um, I'll say at the outset, though, that Thailand, even though it's adopted some of the shared model legislation that the UN has urged upon us, um, the Counter-Terrorism Committee has urged upon us, as domestic policies, we actually see Thailand um, passing less counter-terrorism law than Australia has. Thankfully, Thailand does not have an offence of possessing a thing connected to terrorism, the charge that Fahim Lodi in Australia was convicted of um, and is serving a, a substantial sentence. Um, a hand clapper, a foot clapper, a bandana in the family home, if mass political protest were to be considered to be terrorism, is not able to be prosecuted as a thing connected with terrorism in the Thai context, even though it's one of the many offences that have been added in the Australian statute book. So what does Thai counterterrorism law say? That if you commit an act of violence, which is very broadly defined, um, injury to body or mind, by physical force or by any other means, or performing any action which endangers the life or seriously endangers the body of someone, or most importantly, the freedom of any person. Now this is where the scope becomes exceptionally broad even to start with. We can use any type of violence or any type of action um, to endanger life, um, but also to restrict the freedom of any person. I want you to be thinking about what you know about the red shirt protests and the yellow shirt protests over time. Committing any act which causes serious damage to the public transportation system, communication system, or basic infrastructure. Broad terms, powerful laws. Commits any act which causes damage to any states or person's property or the environment. Or most importantly, in some of these protests, causes or is likely to cause, and I've been critical of the likely to cause formulation in the Australian context, substantial economic injury. So these are broad offences. If such an act is committed with the intention of compelling or forcing the Thai government or a foreign government or an international organisation to perform or not perform any action, which will cause serious injury or in order to create disorder or confusion by causing the people to be afraid, similar types of triggers in the Australian context. But have we already got law that easily covers a lot of the facts of the PAD protests from 2008 and the UDD protests from 2000? and 10. Um, is this an example of how penal populism gives us the ability to not use standard criminal law and criminal procedure, but to think about the appropriateness of charging terrorism offences against political protesters? I'm getting to some better news, hopefully, with the qualification. Interestingly, in Got My Mai in 2008, there were two views about the PAD, the yellow shirt protests. Um, firstly, going through the type of law that I've just introduced you to, we clearly have terrorism under section 35 slash one um, of the Thai Criminal Code. 
but we also have terrorism-related offences, speech that coerces governments, um, causing the cessation of business, let's say it's one of boom, to coerce the government as civil actions as well favoured by this author. So on the one hand, yes, the yellow shirt protests easily are terrorism with criminal law and relate to civil um, actions that have terrorism overtones. Then we have um, Police Lieutenant Colonel Prolong Siri Gun um, suggesting, not by going through the law that I've just gone through, but just conceptually, socially, psychologically, what do we think so um, terrorism is? In some of my empirical social psychological research, I have found this a fascinating issue to actually give different groups of people the same set of facts and say, is this terrorism or not in a, in a popular conception? The way this article proceeds is the PAD leadership of the time and their actions were not like the actions of Lashka e Toiba, um, quite a renowned and blacklisted terrorist organisation. Um, not like any of the other historical examples of international terrorism. PAD is not a prescribed terrorist organisation, so this is not terrorism, anything that these protesters do. Even if I might share that view, um, the thing that worries me is that the law is so much broader than that discussion. Um, a person can be arrested and denied bail because they're charged with a terrorist offence, because the law is so broad. This second debate is a good moral political debate to have, but does it help anyone who's been charged with terrorist offences in political protest contexts? Here's the good news, maybe. As in Australia, the Thai model provision actually says that the actions of marching, assembling, protesting, raising an objection or mobilising in order to demand help from the government or to receive justice, wonderful text, which is the use of constitutional freedoms, problematic text, is not a terrorist offence. So it all sounds well and good, doesn't it, for people charged with political rallying, for example, um, as terrorism. But the fear I have is that the constitutional freedoms that are mentioned in this political protest exemption may not be enough to protect those people charged with it. Why? And on a quick run through here, let's look at freedom of expression. Let's um, also look at freedom of association. Section 45 says a person shall enjoy the liberty to express his opinion, make speech, write, print, publicise and make expression by other means. Sounds exceptionally good, but as you know from the exercise of emergency decrees, etc., the restriction on liberty under paragraph 1 shall not be imposed except by virtue of the law specifically enacted for the purpose of maintaining the security of the state. So when political protest activity occurs under the emergency decree, um, we have a constitutional exemption to the freedom of expression. Don't we have a problem too with using what the Thai counterterrorism law provides, which is the protection of political protest? Wonderful around the world to see this exemption in domestic counterterrorism law, but how does it work in practice when you apply it to the facts of the case? Um, we have the similar problem, don't we, with freedom of association under section 63 of the current constitution. A person shall enjoy the liberty to assemble peacefully and without arms, um, and those facts have been strained on, in some of the protests. Um, but again, you can pass those emergency decrees and other laws for securing public con convenience in use of public places, or for the maintenance of public order during the time when the country is in a state of war, or when a state of emergency or martial law is declared. So again, I have some real concerns about the best part of most modern counter-terrorism law in Thailand and in Australia. We haven't had a situation, even though we've had 22 successful counter-terrorism convictions in Australia, we haven't had a situation of someone claiming the political protest exemption in Australia. So as a domestic criminal law scholar in Australia, I look to Thailand, hopefully, um, to get some extra um, understanding of how we should interpret that exemption in Australian counter-terrorism law. Maybe that's a vain hope, but I have it nonetheless. Um, just finally, uh, a lot of what's called a terrorism charge in Thailand is of course um, a charge under the Computer Crime Act, um, which itself does not have the same type of explicit political protest protection that we see in counter-terrorism law, silent on the matter. So we fall back on 
constitutional protections which themselves can be qualified, as I've already discussed, in times of emergency decree, etc. Um, so isn't there an irony here? That people who are charged under the most serious law, counter-terrorism law, and you know, the, the penalties are quite stiff here, we have death, imprisonment for life, or imprisonment from three years to 20 years, and a fine of 60,000 baht to 1 million baht um, under counter-terrorism law. Is it kind of exciting to be charged under counter-terrorism law if you've got a glimmer of hope of defending yourself um, compared to a Computer Crime Act uh, charge? Horrible thought, horrible irony. Um, maybe in some of the cases that we're going to see coming to the Thai courts, we will see um, some defendants making strong political protest exemption arguments. Um, but we've had the discussion of one of these such computer crime cases, the acquittal of Kei Tong. But here, we don't get to the level of actually comparing the cyber crime or the, counter, the computer crime act um, offence against counter-terrorism law. And he's really acquitted for factual reasons about the, um, the posting to the website and who did it and when and all sorts of things. So let me leave you with those thoughts. I'm going to be a keen watcher of any counter-terrorism prosecution in Thailand for all these reasons. <coughs> If Australia can learn something from it, I think that's all well and good. If um, some justice can be given via political protest exemptions or otherwise, that could be a useful result as well. Thank you very much. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jane Ferguson from the School of Culture, History and Language. Thank you so much, Tyrrell, for um, organizing. I've already um, learned so much from the different um, speakers and um, I have Yet another thing which we can debate its relevance to what's already been said. So actually, for my presentation, I'm going to be considering the relationship of Thailand to um, Burma in the past couple of years and raise some questions about regime change and the questions of politics and business. As usual, um, the relationship between um, the military, the state, and capital, and then in particular, how does this affect um, migrants and refugees. So skipping back a little bit in history, I would like to draw your attention to a promise of the then Prime Minister Thein Sein to Prime Minister Apisit at the 2009 ASEAN meetings in Hua Hin. Thein Sein vowed that he would not allow for any opposition party to the Thai Kingdom to use Burmese soil as a staging ground for anti-government activity. In all likelihood, this was in rep um, in reference to um, Taksin, how he would get to Burma without changing planes in Bangkok, Suwanifum, I wonder. But anyway, fast forwarding to just a week ago, the head of the Thai National Security Council, Tawin Pansri, had discussed the closing of the 10 refugee camps along the Thai-Burma border. As Tawin said, the refugees have been in Thailand for more than 20 years, and it became our burden to take care of them. I cannot say when we will close down the camps, but we intend to do it. We are now in the process of discussion with the Myanmar government. There seems to be an odd form of um, terrestrial cooperation here. We're not going to house any our, uh, enemies of your states, or so they are saying. Right now, there are 142,000 refugees from Burma living in Thailand border camps, and approximately 2 million migrant workers working in Thailand, both documented and undocumented, in the bottom <coughs> echelons of the Thai economy. Remittances in Burma constitute 5% of Burma's GDP, a number double that of foreign direct investment. In my contribution to these discussions, I would like to consider the relationship between Burmese and Thai governments in general, and in generals, I suppose, and the extent to which um, government, military, and business relationships have been changing in stripe independently and in response to each other. Part of the negotiations deemed necessary for Apisit taking power was that several cabinet positions were handed to the Pumjai Thai party. Thus, since 2009, there has been a massive increase in the country's military budget. Next door, Burma's military spendings account for over half of its national budget, and despite, in spite of new changes in outward government appearance, this has no ch signs of changing. In fact, particularly in the Shan state in Burma's northeast, there have been increases in forced recruitments, 
as well as pressures towards former ceasefire groups to become border guard forces. And because of these, more Shan in particular have been migrating to Thailand to escape the military presses, as well as the um, internationally funded capital intensive projects that have resulted in more military activity to clear out the areas. The extent to which both national militaries will be complicit in international business at both the level of large-scale capital-intensive projects such as hydropower dams and coal mines, as well as the level of migrant workers and vulnerable border crosses, crossers remains to be seen. While Thailand's political leadership seems somehow much more willing to brandish its military garb, the Burmese generals are much more willing to doff their uniforms in favor of starched linen shirts and silk longjis in order to wield political power in their country and create an image of a democracy to the international community. Last October, Prime Minister Abhisit made his trip to Burma, where he was greeted by a military marching band which played the Thai national anthem for him. Um, if you're interested, you can look this up on YouTube on the um, Hanthawadi news site. It was really actually kind of trippy to watch um, Apisit arrive in, um, in Nepida and then have the whole you know, military band playing the Thai national anthem for him. Part of the goal of the visit, according to reports, was for Thailand to assure the Burmese authorities on behalf of its Bur business investors that things would be business as usual. And it's odd kinds of you know, switching roles and deja vu going back and forth here. One of the aims also for this meeting was a promise for the tripling of Thai-Burmese trade by 2015. The shared border has long been an important conduit for trade, and during July and August of last year, the closure of the Mesot Mayawadi crossing led to a loss of $10 million for Thai firm, $100 million for Thai firms, while Yangon suffered from shortages of commercial products. At the larger level, Thai investors were holding their breath regarding the November 2010 elections in Burma. As a diplomat is quoted in, as saying in the Irrawaddy magazine, a lot of small to medium businesses on both sides have been suffering in recent months due to the border crossing closures by Burma, but there are bigger trade prizes on offer if less state-fettered Burmese economy is permitted in the elections. Burma and Thailand certainly do have a great deal in common, but what of the recent strategy of Thailand's military to take a more overt role in politics while Burma's top brass is trying to look more civilian? And this also flashes back to 1989, then Prime Minister, Thai Prime Minister Chat Chai Chunawen uh, promising to turn uh, then battlefields into marketplaces. And um, the extent to which you have to remain in military uniform to do so, uh, up up until 2010, um, the Burmese government would say, oh sure, it's great, just stay in uniform, you don't have to have a civilian front for this. But then Thailand seems to have um, changed on this issue uh, twice. So is a civilian government mere window dressing? And to what extent is the military and the army complicit in mediating these negotiations between um, capital and then the local areas? Uh, just skip this part. So here's an image of the Salween River, um, the longest uh, free-flowing river in Southeast Asia. One of these projects is the Tatsang Dam being built by a Thai company in the Shan state of Burma. The company's name is MDX Limited, and the Burmese government has provisioned that 85% of its expected output of over 7,000 megawatts will be sold to Thailand. The cooperation on the part of the Burmese government has been mainly military. They have concentrated more and more troops near the Tatsang Dam site, whereas in 1996 there were 10 battalions in nearby townships. Now there are over 30. And since 1996, not just because of Tatsang Dam, but throughout the Shan state, over 300,000 um, people have been displaced by the military. Um, here's a, well, this is actually in Pao areas in the Shan state, but just this past week, um, Thai investors, the Saraburi Coal Mining Group, recently signed a contract which would allow them to export coal from the two townships in the eastern Shan state for the next 30 years. This project will take place approximately 70 kilometers north of the border with the Thai pro province of Chiang Rai, and they have begun relocating villagers and destroying existing farms and paddy fields to make way for the coal mine. 
It's speculated that Saraburi Group uh, plans to use the coal to, uh, as fuel in cement factories in Thailand. An international labor organization survey estimated that Thailand is host to 1.8 million migrants, the majority of whom are from Burma. They constitute 5% of the Thai labor force and carry out the dangerous, difficult, and dirty jobs that the Thais, if they can help it, won't do. Their net contribution to the Thai economy is around $53 million annually. Although it has been possible for workers to register, the costly and time-consuming process precludes many from doing so. Extended permission is part of the new national verification process, which would make migrants submit biographical data, including Burmese registration information to Thai employment officials, or more likely pay brokers to do so on their behalf. If they don't go through this process, migrants are faced with the possibility of deportation. This process can cost 6,000 baht, prohibitively expensive for many. According to a Shan informant I talked to last February, to pay the fees for both the travel permit and the registry is like being hit from both sides. Who would have money to live on and forget about sending anything home? Under Taksin, a mass registration and incentive program motivated one million migrants to register. But this past year, that number fell to 500,000. An interesting correlation here, and one which isn't likely to make the headlines, is the tension between the Thai central government and the police and the army regarding the migrants. With registration fees going to the districts and provincial governance, but then what of the army checkpoints? In the periphery especially, um, the army might not want workers to be registered. Another problem here is that there is not a long-term migration policy and perhaps this reflects tension between regional political authorities, the district officials, the police, as well as the army, in addition to the business interests which very much depend on a supply of inexpensive labor. In particular, it is the government's alien, illegal alien workers management committee, the um, Kwabaura, which is the umbrella organization of 22 separate agencies, which is relatively weak compared to the military and business interests that it must contend with in considering migration and work policies. Overall, the Burma case and its relationship with Thailand dealt um, between the military and the state, um, as Dr. Reynolds nicely pointed out, this problem is a regional issue, as are the repercussions for those who are disenfranchised by all regimes involved. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Dr. Nicholas Farrelly from the School of Regulation, Justice, and Diplomacy. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much to Tyrrell for organising such a stimulating event. It is simply wonderful to see you all here. So there is a pretty standard set of future-gazing questions that analysts of Thai politics and society get asked these days. Will there be an election in 2011? Who will win any prospective poll? Can former Prime Minister Thaksin Shinawat ever return to formal politics? Will there be another military coup? Is further bloodshed likely? What happens when King Bumipon Adunyadeh dies? Would King Wajiralongkorn be good for Thai democracy? What about Princess Sirintorn? Could she be a real possibility for Thailand's throne? Is Thailand lurching towards another long period of dictatorship? Can the country ever become a republic? Most of these questions lead to simply impossible puzzles. Our tools of prognosis are so weak that a well-informed answer is naturally tentative. But seeking answers to these questions about the future of Thailand is a challenge that many in this room face. Assessing the evidence for particular futures and weighing up a portfolio of alternative scenarios is important intellectual work. It tends, of course, to differ from other academic activities in the sense that it is profoundly, sometimes comprehensively, speculative. From where I sit, if we want to do a serious job of examining Thailand's future, then much more attention needs to be paid to the fundamentals of how we go about answering these kinds of questions. To illustrate my point, 
Today I have time to dwell on two of these questions at some length. First, what happens when King Bumibon, Thailand's Rama IX, dies? It's a troubling question, I appreciate that, and many Thais are uncomfortable to even have it raised. So where do we start? With history, I suggest, but what history? Recent examples of what happens when Thai kings die are few and far between. The last succession, caught up in the murky events of 1946 when Rama VIII was found dead, don't actually help us all that much. It's very unlikely that King Bumibon will die in such mysterious circumstances. Turning back the clock even further, we have events around the revolution of 1932 and the abdication that followed to consider. Those events show certainly that the institution of the monarchy has faced tremendous transitional challenges in the past. And then we have 1910, when Rama V, King Chulalongkorn, died. He's the only king who challenges the incumbent for the mantle of the greatest in many Thai estimations. He died after reigning for 42 years. After Rama V's reign, the monarchy struggled for decades to redefine itself. Part of the challenge was that the king's reformist zeal had catalyzed a process of widespread social transformation. But Rama V died more than a century ago. Can we really look to those events to understand Thailand's future? I suggest that we can, but we need to work much harder at it, and far more attention needs to be paid to some of this history. Far more attention should also be paid to recent events, now fading quickly into our memories. On the 2nd of January 2008, King Bumibon's elder sister, Princess Galyani, passed away. Thailand was thus flung into a period of nationwide mourning. I was there at the Grand Palace on the first day of that period of mourning. I was taking the pulse of the crowd, attempting to get some sense of the social and political ramifications. As analysts, I think we must acknowledge that very few people in Thailand are prepared to openly talk about what might happen when the king dies. Nonetheless, this is, I suggest, a fundamental question for any future gazing, and it is through the reading of history that our speculation can be sharpened and our assessments given the richness that only past experience can bring. The second question that I want to briefly introduce has a somewhat different flavour. Is Thailand lurching towards another long period of dictatorship? Current indications are that at least some among the ruling coalition government led by Prime Minister Apisit Wejatiwa want to see immediate elections. Perhaps the Prime Minister himself is counted among that number. We may see elections called one day very, very soon. If we do, then a whole range of historical materials will become very relevant for probing the relationship between elections and dictatorship. Thailand's history of elections remains ignominious by any democratic standard. It is a rare government that wins an election and sees out its first term to win another. It is the Thai Rak Thai political machine built by former Prime Minister Thaksin that has most successfully mastered the art of democratic campaigning. It won two big victories by explicitly playing a tried and tested game of Thai politics, what is often described as Gan Len Gan Mu. So we know all of this already, and it's not much of a surprise, but what we probably haven't paid sufficient attention to in the context of Thailand's lurch away from democratic institutions and processes is that the last genuinely free elections held in Thailand saw absolutely magnificent successes for Thaksin's political machine. The history of the February 2005 victory in particular has not really been examined all that closely. And one reason is that by the time of the September 2006 military coup, so many other issues had come to define Thai political debates. And almost all of those issues were further defined by the dominance of unelected groups from the palace and the army. 
But the election results still tell the story. When ties went to the polls on the 6th of February 2005, the results were really pretty clear. The Thai Ruk Thai Party, um, soon to be disbanded uh, in the 2006 coup after Math won more than 60% of the vote. Um, it had a bumper majority of the likes really never seen in Thai political history. The Democrat Party did okay, I suppose, for a minor party, um, not for a party that could claim to be able to form a government. Um, Cha Thai and Mahachon uh, came in third and fourth down a list of many other political parties which never really had a chance of getting anybody into parliament against the juggernaut that was Thai Rak Thai. If Thailand is now going to lurch into another period of some kind of dictatorship where elections become a hazy memory, then paying, paying attention to the history of Thaksin's unprecedented electoral success I think remains crucial. Based on that history, Prime Minister Apisit's political allies and establishment backers have reason to be pretty nervous about any future poll. Perhaps this explains their hesitation. History shows that, regardless of the obstacles, nobody wins elections in Thailand like Thaksin Shinawat and his political machine. So if we are going to try to answer the key questions about Thailand's political future, I suggest we look really closely at the historical record. We need to look back to some of the periods of history that have helped to define Thailand's parliament, its monarchy, its army, its peasantry and its business elite. Without more historical depth, our assessments, I think, remain impossible um, if we're trying to deal with the fundamental puzzles and questions which should exercise us all. And by looking to Thailand's past, I'd suggest that we may find fragments that provide useful evidence for understanding the inevitably difficult years that are to come. Thank you. Sorry. I'd like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Dr. Pongki Sut Pusparat from the School of International Political and Strategic Studies. Thank you. What are appropriate to end this uh, speaker panel with a Thai, among a non Thai speaker. Uh, my presentation today is going to touch upon the uh, foreign policy of, of this country, Thailand, and I give the topic of this uh, presentation is beyond the limit the exercise of nationalism in Thai foreign policy. During the past few years, uh, we can see that nationalism has become an import, important element in, in Thai politics, uh, especially regarding external relations with foreign countries and neighboring countries in particular. Recent conflict in Cambodia, uh, with Cambodia over Perbihan Temple uh, is a primary example of this phenomenon. Uh, with continuity of tension and conflict, um, conflict during these past years, uh, Thailand definitely has overused nationalism uh, beyond its limit. Let's see, uh, not only the, the, when we talk about nationalism, it's not only the, the bad thing. Na well, nationalism as, as like uh, other public good, it has the optimal utilities. Um, with a balanced attachment in national identity, nationalism, uh, a country can uh, unify and have a sense of community which helps and support na nation building and a stronger economy. With less uh, national, too little nationalism uh, attached within the, the national community, a uh, country may fail into weak state uh, with social uh, disruption, lack of sense of uh, community and dedication of uh, public work. However, uh, in, th in this case, too much nationalism can also drive a country into conflict with a foreign country, especially a neighboring country, and even within the, uh, its own diverse ethnic groups. Nationalism in current political conflict uh, basically play roles in this uh, political situation to delegitimize and attack other political groups by way of instigating border uh, dispute, attacking others who might think differently from the mainstream, and an easy accusation of Arthur as anti-selling a country and disloyal to the nation. 
let's see this graph while well, trying to put and map out all the events since the 19, uh, 2008. But actually, nationalism has been manipulated before that. Uh, if we recall the history in 2005, uh, Thaksin was uh, accused of selling the Thai nation by selling his uh, Shinkop to uh, Singaporean Temasek. And that consequence uh, leads to the military government in 2007 to suspend some bilateral relation activity with Singapore uh, when Thaksin allowed to enter Singapore. And then from 2008 onward, uh, nationalism has been fired up around the disputed area of Pawihan Temple, uh, especially since Cambodia registered uh, the Pawihan Temple as a world heritage. Then Thailand saw the joint listing of the, of, of the rune with Cambodia, which subsequently uh, came as a joint communi communique in June 2008 uh, to support this listing. Then we saw anti samak rally uh, against this joint community in the end of June. Uh, the current government then, the opposition party, was banned bargaining with the, the PAT or the yellow shirt, picking this issue to mobilize political support against pro toxin group. They accused them as having a personal interest with the Hun Sen government and call constitutional court to rule this, over this issue. Then constitutional court rule over this joint communique as unconstitutional and forced Anopodon to resign a few days after the ruling. Military tension started from mid-July, August, and a little bit after that, when Thai troops deployed around uh, the disputed area, Hun Sen asked ASEAN to intervene, and Thai rejected. Uh, Hun Sen issued ultimatum to, to Thailand to withdraw the troops in around mid-October, and right a day after that, Kassit uh, commented on Hun Sen in one of the PAT demonstrations as crazy, slave, and knuckling, or a gangster. Gassit also comment again about Hun Sen during the pat uh, closure of the Suvarnabhumi airport. In his speech, he said he would use Hun Sen's blood to wash his feet, which recalled the Thai historical version of King Narei Sun doing the same act to a Cambodian king during a UTI period. Then moved to 2009, some clashes uh, broke out in early April. Apisit also announced that he would uh, withdraw his support to the listing of, of the Pravihan Temple. Then 2010, end of, the, uh, end of Jan, we saw some um, conflict for five days uh, during the end of Jan and another one in mid-April. Apisit gave a speech at Pat again and at that time it has a new politics party uh, saying that uh, his government would not surrender any inches to the Cambodian and would take anything back. At uh, the end of that year, we saw seven Thai nationals were arrested by Cambodian authority of intruding into the territory. Um, then this stirred up the public outcry, especially among conservative group uh, over the disputed area and the arrest of the Thai na nationals, uh, and led to the dem demonstrations of, of a big yellow support and, uh, and alliance, which comprised of had Thai Patriotic Network and, and, and Santi Aso against Cambodia, and this time against the, the current Thai government's uh, soft measure on the issue. They closed the government compound for, for almost a month. This time, the yellow shirt and its ally went farther than uh, the Democrat Party initially wanted to see. They demand the use of force to take the lost territories back to Thailand. Also, Joy Commission uh, took place in uh, early fe February. Then the following day, there were armed clashes over you know, the, the disputed area and lasted for 10 days. UNSC called for ceasefire and mandated ASEAN to intervene. Uh, then Jakarta meeting uh, held in uh, around end of, of February. Both parties agreed to you know, uh, manage this conflict peacefully. But then, regardless of that agreement, uh, armed conflict uh, still continue in April and recently in, in May. And end of uh, last year, uh, last uh, month, Cambodia also announced that it will request the International Court of Justice to rule, uh, to reinterpret 
the 1962 ruling, and this is the, at the current stage. The current conflict with Cambodia seems to accrue more cost than benefit. Relationship with Cambodia deteriorate, people's security is seriously affected, with death toll and casualty among civilian and military rising. Truth has been, co have been covered. Nobody knows exactly how many people die and who shoot who first and what kind of weapons they use. National dignity in the international community is tarnished. Benefit, perhaps among the small group of political uh, conservative group uh, and probably Thai military to have a justification to play a role in the current political, uh, political scene. If I want to evaluate uh, the optimality of using nationalism uh, during this current uh, situation, I would say that at this stage, we use uh, nationalism too much. Uh, trade with Cambodia fluctuated and declined since 2009. Apparently, hatred among the two countries, people from the two countries, uh, increased. It also has resurrected a Thai self-image of superiority vis-a-vis -vis neighboring country in which state ideological uh, past glory is more important than truth and accepting the truth. This has deepened many Thais' belief in the official nationalism without carefully thinking about their act. And then, back to the current government's foreign policy. If I was a teacher and would grade uh, the government, probably I would give F, uh, three Fs, uh, probably especially with the relation with, with neighboring country, uh, the promotion of human rights, uh, democracy and humanitarianism, and of course, in maintaining Thailand's good image and attitude toward Thailand. Conclusion, this nationalism create antagonistic view toward neighbor, drag Thailand into armed conflict, divert state apparatus from achieving other important goals, deprive Thailand's international status, and eventually limit Thailand's external interests. Thank you. Oh. Our engineer, who would like to do it. Fantastic panel. Uh, really excellent and uh, very much enjoyed the various uh, complementary perspectives. Uh, one question for Dr. Thomas. Uh, just in relation to the Cambodian border situation. Um, it strikes me that uh, Ronald media has uh, been portraying Thailand as the perpetrator of the conflict. Um, and one of the things that struck me is how, um, how well-timed um, releases from Agent Chance Press in my opinion have been uh, when these instances have taken place. Um, and one of the things that's been conjectured is that the conflict was really uh, Sure, it's aided and abetted by the, the, the nationalistic politics that's been um, uh, involved in PND on the border. But what's uh, perhaps fundamental to the problem, what's deeper than that, is the demarcation uh, and the dispute of whose line counts, the French drawn line or the American drawn line. Um, and, and really, what we're talking about is perhaps the delta between the two lines in the top of the and the oil and gas reserves that are, that are known to be there. My sense is that Hun Sen's actually got a big role playing this, uh, and that Thailand can have bad, uh, bad press to a certain extent with good reason, so I feel it's an unfair one for the I think, of course, Hun Sen will play a big role in this, in this issue, and of course, as we all know, uh, he gained majority in the Cambodian politics. And uh, the new election is coming in probably soon. And probably like, we always uh, see from hear from media that he's saying normally uh, would use this issue as the uh, support. But if you think that Thai media, uh, the role of Thai media, actually, if you look carefully and read Thai media, basically anything any bad comment about uh, Cambodia will occupy more uh, space in Thai media than what the Thai elite would you know, comment uh, about, about Hun Sen and Cambodia. And 
I think uh, for that for for that uh, reason, uh, a lot of Thai who you know, normally consume uh, mainstream media would, would, would understand that you know, uh, Hun Sen would, would be the, the first to strike. But then, in terms of military uh, tactic, I think it, 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 it's quite convention, conventional that normally it's a common practice a lot you know, between uh, military around this region that even though agreement on ceasefire uh, is discussed, but on the ground, uh, military always trying to, to uh, how do you call it, you know, to, 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 to occupy as much as possible of the strategic area. And in, in, this, in this, uh, this case, it, it, it comes to the media that, well, sometimes, sometimes Thai media would, would blame uh, the, the Cambodian military that, you know, during the ceasefire, why you buy the, the arm first? But that's not the case. And Thai always uh, provoked the, the, the first five as well. I think the speakers here have given us a lot of uh, angles and, uh, about the Thai political region, but I think uh, one point that uh, they haven't really charged is about the conflict and the violence in the South, which I think is um, quite an important aspect of the Thai political region. So with the, the, the case about the deaths in the Thai and also the unsolved um, case of um, lawyer Song Chai, what do you think will happen or could happen after the election? Would there be anything to improve or would still see this violence increase? Any Depends who wins. <laughs> so, who wins? I'm actually going to jump in and answer that question. Yeah, I don't want to actually think about the election of that moment. Um, and I say this because both of those cases in which, I'll just say a little bit about it, but in some cases which is the appeal of the women, which just came out, um, is it extremely troubling because it points to the difficulty of being had now and not having the category of the difference. Um, and so we're going to have to be for the idea of prosecution for the only person who is trying to try to do In the case of that guy, which is also solved um, in the legal process and so in a very fun way in which the courts have said, yes, the people who um, I don't actually think that's the to the other parties in the but it's symptomatic of much of the situation in the Um, Dr. Ward, 
just back to your point about um, Thailand's economic growth and your argument about the opportunity cost of not investing in agricultural productivity. What, what's been the net effect of those direct cash transfers and those kind of things in the savings rate and the overall growth of the economy? Well, <coughs> these transfers can reduce poverty incidents in the short run, but not sustainable, because they don't raise anybody's productivity. And here's my great disappointment with the way Taksin Shinawa thought about agriculture. He saw it as the backward sector. It just happened to be all these voters there. But in terms of its contribution to the economy, it was backward. That was yesterday's. The important sectors are IT and telecommunications and stuff like that. So he was interested in it. And so he wasn't, he, when he talked about the future of the Thai economy, he never talked about the contribution that agriculture can make to economic growth. But that's just wrong because agriculture really has contributed. The big, uh, con uh, a major con con contributor to Thailand's export growth has been processed food based on agriculture. This is really an important industry for Thailand. The toxins have taken no interest in that. He was more interested in, it's my interpretation, in buying political support through cash transfers to village heads and uh, farmer debt relief, things like that, not interested in promoting productivity growth within agriculture. And that was a big mistake. It's long-term contribution to act to economic growth, those transfers, is nothing. Can, can I comment a little bit? I, I, I agree with Peter on the, the problem with Thai agricultural productivity. It hasn't improved. Um, as much as it should, and certainly compared to neighbouring countries, the performance is very poor. But I think, you know, I think there's a risk of, of stereotyping um, Tuxin's policies as cash handouts. Oh, no, they didn't give money to village heads. They established um, village credit funds. They established, you know, micro credit schemes in every village that were administered by <coughs> village committees and oversighted by the Bank of Agriculture and Cooperatives. Um, and, you know, I think the performance of those schemes has been uneven. Um, but to suggest it's made no contribution to agricultural productivity, I think, is wrong. I've well, certainly in the part of Thailand where I um, work, it, the, the village credit funds were very important for people in buying agricultural inputs, um, in giving them a source of money that would help them perhaps rotate other loans. Um, so I think, I think, you know, like, it was, it was an important contribution to rural credit and agricultural credit. Um, the other schemes, like the, the, the important SML, the small, medium, large scheme, where, where villages were given money for, for various types of projects. Um, yes, I suspect a lot of them were, were village halls and things like that, that, that don't really contribute to agricultural productivity. Um, but there are others that, that were directly attempting to address that in terms of various um, you know, rice milling projects or, or crop processing projects. So I think, yes, I, I think I generally agree with Peter that the performance has been not good. Um, but I don't think the, I think there's this impression that the rural areas and rural people, there was just this flood of cash. Um, there was significant economic stimulus and economic projects in villages. Um, that continued those trends that I showed in those graphs that have been happening since the 70s. Yeah, I a question for Nicholas. Um, in view of, uh, or uh, rather well uh, distributed uh, point about uh, size, <coughs> Would you expect that at the next election there will be the elect will be the election of a People's or Labour Party? All right, thanks, Colin. It's a, it's a good question, and it comes again to this um, perpetual issue of future gazing. Um, so, who's going to win an election, and um, what kind of policies would they likely take to it? Of course, we still wait with bated breath for um, the election to be called, um, assuming that was to happen soon. Um, that may be one indication that the polling that the Democrat Party coalition government has suggests that they think they'll win. Um, if we see them further stalling uh, the election, 
and thus any possible defeat they might suffer, then it would be very indicative of the fact that um, they're getting bad numbers out of their pollsters. Um, all that said, I think that the betting money for a very long time has been on a poor tie, thus Thaksin Shinawat victory in an election next month or in a year's time or frankly in four or five years time. Um, uh, there would be a range of different views in this room um, on exactly how effective uh, Apisit and his allies could be in, in cobbling together some different kind of coalition, but that will take skill, which I, I don't think we've really seen demonstrated yet, um, except for in that brief and very dramatic period in late 2008 when that government was first formed. some serious tactical errors on the behalf of the Red Shirts. Um, there were groups whose role in relation to the Red Shirts I think is still mysterious and possibly always will be, who, who certainly played a role in escalating that violence. Um, but just look at the death tolls. And I like it was so uneven. This, this, was, this was the state's military forces um, deployed against political protesters. I think, yes, we can argue about, you know, grenade attacks or black shirts or whatever like that, but I think that, that big picture is there. Um, now, why did that happen? I think that I think the, you're sort of hinting at the, the psychology of the protesters and the political motivations. I think the research on that, certainly as far as I'm concerned, that's still to be done. Um, I think, the big, for me, the big picture driving um, politically energising sentiment is this desire for a productive relationship with the government on the part of rural people. I think this old notion that government is a matter for Bangkok and you know the rural people elect the government and the city people get rid of the government, I think that is now being fundamentally challenged and I suppose what I'm suggesting is there's a very sensible economic basis for that because the rural economy <coughs> is now very dependent on all, all sorts of government support and it's a very important relationship to the thing. I've covered it from my perspective. Well, I might say something, uh, um, since I haven't said anything. Um, I'm not a political scientist and I'm not a person who follows uh, the police and military, but one of the things that struck me about the 
what's, what's happened in the last year uh, is, is how the military, particularly the Army, has, has become even more important in, the, uh, in this complex thing that people call the state or the government. Um, of course, there was a military coup in 2006, and we know something about the, about the history since then. Um, I, I'm, just, I'm just struck by, by and, and Nick, Nick wants to talk about history as help, helping us see the future. Historians don't much like talking about the future. They prefer thinking about the past. And one of the things that happens at the end of a reign is that, is that the, um, particularly at the very end of the reign, is that the, the palace guard groups around the, the, the monarch. And uh, one of the explanations for the military coming forward, taking charge, uh, well, the previous uh, military guy, Panopong, last year was a little bit ambivalent about how he should handle the protest, but now we have Prayut, we have a very different situation. This is all very reminiscent of the kinds of things that happen <coughs> at the end of the reign. So, uh, yes, we have elections, uh, yes, we have uh, popular protests, but we also have this other thing going on which is shaping this particular historical moment. And um, we don't know how long this historical moment will last. That's what the historian would say. I'll just say something quickly, because I must go to teach, unfortunately. So I will be rushing away after this statement. But uh, maybe inherent in the question is that we can look back on, say, the, the Red Shirt protest and say that there was an homogenous group there that had one motive. And Thankfully, Thai counterterrorism law does not require us to say that the person being charged with um, counterterrorism is advancing one political, religious, or ideological cause. Australian counterterrorism law does that. But still, to the extent that counterterrorism prosecutions are constructions of social reality and protest actions, um, I think there is a little bit of a danger in your question of saying that the Red Show protests, or even the the 2008 Yellow Shirt protests can easily be labelled as one particular movement of a particular type. Um, and just from the perspective of the danger for some defendants facing counterterrorism action, um, I think we need to be much more subtle about that if justice is to be done. Yeah, yeah actually, my question was regarding Mark's comments. Maybe you can call it off. <laughs> <laughs> one or two more seconds. Uh, they don't stay, you know, it's actually theatre for half an hour like that. Okay, so I'm um, going <laughs> to the question. So <laughs> you can get five times. Uh, you, you mentioned the last one of the people who had been charged or apparently will be charged with uh, various offences. And I just wondered what you think the motivation is for that very large number, given that the police could presumably charge them with other offences. And uh, I had a second question that we probably won't have time for, but perhaps other uh, participants would like to give comments on this. And that is uh, regarding the criminal justice system and the use of the criminal justice system in Thailand for political purposes, what its current situation is and what the trends seem to be in that respect. I can't answer the first question in a definitive manner, but of course the use of any counterterrorism law in any jurisdiction sometimes is as much about interruption and disturbance of a particular group than it is about wanting to follow the prosecution through to a conviction. So, in many jurisdictions, there is that role for counterterrorism law as well, especially something that's denied by it. It's about breaking up groups in society, it's about um, having people in a, a holding pattern, if you like. And uh, to me, that, that's one of the biggest challenges to the principles of criminal justice. When we have these, these quite powerful laws, counterterrorism laws, used merely to detain and to have people wait a potential trial for a very serious offence, when standard criminal law group that have dealt with the blame of the criminality of their actions in a much more standard and straightforward way. Perhaps I'm believe by suggesting that I'm going on in the side. I must go. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
actualization. Like, for example, one thing that keeps coming through, like freedom of expression is a challenge. We have 6,000 you know, community radio stations which tend to be rare and yellow propaganda. Um, there's increasing, what, what I see is there's increasing divide. Where are the spaces where there can be dialogue which can enable collaborative progress towards this future, where there may be a shift in the way the time of the system operates, the bureaucracy continues, um, the royal situation is resolved. Where do you see any spaces where that dialogue is possible? Because it seems to be increasingly possible to have participation in dialogue, which is such a key element, I would say, in, in the work we do. Well, I think Thailand's painted itself into a corner because you know the whole the whole sort of prohibition on discussion of the royals. Um, you know, we're we're going to have King the Jewel on on the throne, and the last thing they can afford to have is open public dialogue. Like he just he 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 simply wouldn't survive that. Um, so so I think they've they've created a, a situation where open public dialogue on political issues. And it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to, to create, um, because through their own creation, there are now there's now this great backlog of stuff um, that they simply can't afford to let come out in public. Um, on the first half of your question, um, you know, to some extent, do we need dialogue to resolve division? Um, I don't think we do, in a sense. I think we need institutions that can manage division. And I think that's Thailand's problem. Like, well, it, there's this discourse in Thailand about the importance of national unity. A lot of it's related to the royal narrative. Well, you know, who cares? You know, the, the nature of modern democracies is to be able to have institutions that can deal with differences of opinion. And I think that's what Thailand needs respect for those institutions rather than trying to arrive at some national consensus because that's just such well, a... Yeah, yeah I, I know you agree, mm. but in Thailand so often, Just on that, and I suppose a, a gentle follow-up to, to what Andrew already suggested, um, there is a tidal wave lurking just over the horizon of all kinds of things which um, I'm sure in their um, sleeping hours and some of their waking hours as well give the absolute heebie-jeebies, um, to use the technical phrase, to all kinds of people in Thailand who are absolutely petrified of um, what might be out there that may um, at some stage in the not too distant future have all kinds of really serious implications for the economy and politics and everything else that they've built out and that's why any tolerance for different kinds of perspectives is just frankly impossible. Does the Indonesian model provide any lessons for uh, 
Well, I purposely left it out because, uh, because I was thinking of Thailand's neighbors, so I talked about the neighborhood. Um, Indonesia is an exception to this um, picture that I was painting, uh, and, but, but it hasn't always been thus. I mean, it had a long stretch of, of very authoritarian rule. Um, people also forget the Philippines, too, in discussions. And again, and it's, in, and it's possibly significant that these are both uh, island nation states, and, 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 and although they're each dominated by a particular part of the country, the capital in Indonesia, Java, I think things have changed and there is more disperse, dispersal of, of power, but yeah, you're quite right. I mean, at the moment, that's what it looks like. I mean, but uh, who, who knows? I mean, uh, You'd have to ask the Indonesian folks what they thought about the, about the prospects for the future, but uh, you're quite right. I mean, it uh, doesn't, doesn't fit my model. One final question. Yes. Given the um, coming difficult for in a whole range of areas, economic policy, foreign policy, politics, where should Australia be reaching its efforts with China? We'll start. 30 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> As Australia should be pitching its efforts to promote the fullest and openest discussion of Thai issues possible and avoid the inducements of the Thai government and the Thai embassy to do otherwise. Yeah. I'll probably just correct the <laughs> 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 And if there are other things Australia can be doing, my, my full endorsement goes with Andrew's suggestion, I think we can also be um, as best we can, and I appreciate that at an official level um, Thailand doesn't loom particularly large um, necessarily in Australian eyes, um, we can just be paying a great deal more attention to what's been going on in Thailand and what's likely to happen in the future. Um, we all know the statistics on Australian trade with Thailand, it's a big deal. Um, of course all of these things need to be taken into consideration um, but perhaps um, in five or ten years' time we'll be looking at this period um, and wondering just how it all went so very, very right. Um, it's not as though this is a situation which inevitably goes in disastrous directions and a government like Australia's, I'm sure, has a role to play in staying engaged and keeping up to date. Okay, one thought. Great question. Uh, Australia has long-term interests in common with Thailand. In particular, we're both major agricultural exporters. So we have an interest in working together with the Thai government, whoever that is, to promote open access internationally for the export agricultural commodities. And we do work with them. The Thais will decide who the government is. We work with whoever that is. We respect the rights of the Thais to make that decision and we stay out of it. We respect their right to determine their future, of course. Whoever the government is, we will put them. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to have you from the journey of thanking our fantastic